Okay, so uh, it is 102. I think we can start uh, the panel presentation. Welcome, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to panel one, the status of indigenous people's education. Uh, our first presenter uh, will be a team from uh, University of the Philippines, Baguio. The title of their presentation is Profiling State Universities and Colleges in the, in the Cordillera on the integration of indigenous people's education in higher education curricula. Our authors for this presentation are professors Wilfredo Alangi, uh, Professor Ruth Tindaan, uh, our university researchers, Mr. Jeffrey Javier and Ms. Paola Pamintuan Riva with their um, uh, research associates, uh, Carla Alangi, sorry, and Jorlene Ligawad. Okay, so, um, Professor Alangi is a professor of mathematics at the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at the College of Science, University of the Philippines, Baguio. His training and research interests are in mathematics and culture, indigenous people's education and indigenous knowledge. He was a former Dean of the College of Science and former Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at UP Baguio. His team includes Ms. Paula Riva, Mr. Jeffrey Javier, Professor Ruth Tindaan, who is also the director of the Cordillera Studies Center, Carl Alangi, and Jorlin Ligawad. So now we listen to the presentation of the team uh, to be delivered by Ms. Riva and Mr. Javier. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on this first panel of the International Conference on Cordillera Studies. I am Paula Pamintu Aniva, and I'm joined by Mr. Jeffrey Javier. We are from the Cordillera Studies Center of uh, the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and for this afternoon, we will be presenting the initial results from our study on the profile of state universities and colleges and their integration of uh, indigenous people's education. So for this afternoon, I'll just be starting us off and then Sir Jeff will be taking over about halfway through the presentation. We are happy to be presenting this on behalf of our team members, composing of Professor Wilfredo Vialangi of the College of Science, UP Baguio, and Professor Ruth Tindaan of the College of Arts and Communication and uh, of the Cardinal Study Center as well. As well as on behalf of our research assistants, uh, Carl Alangi, Jorlene Ligawad, and Sheena Vicente. So this will be the outline of our presentation today. We are going to start with a brief introduction on the study and why it came to be, some notes on our methodology considering the events of 2020 and the past year, uh, some mechanisms, processes, and tools in the integration of IP studies in the curriculum of these SUCs, and um, uh, training needs that we have noted in order to operationalize the idea of Indigenous people's education, some institutional strengths and linkages, as well as a few recommendations. So first and foremost, this study was propelled um, by an interest in finding out how state universities and colleges in the region have responded to uh, the Commission on Higher Education Memorandum Order Number 2, which enjoined all public and private higher educational institutions, or HEIs for short, to offer Indigenous people studies in their respective curriculum. So, of course, in the Cordillera, we already know that even prior to this CMO Number 2, Universities have already started providing inputs, generating knowledge with regards to Indigenous peoples' education and Indigenous studies. But we were interested in finding out how the CMO affected that. This is in coordination with other laws and um, policies that have come out since then. So there are a number of objectives uh, for the study. The first was to characterize the mechanisms, as we said earlier, to account for resources and capacity for the implementation of IPED, um, identifying training needs, ascertain institutional strengths, and examine possible theoretical issues and concerns in the approaches of two IP studies in the Cordillera region. 
In order to address these objectives, um, these are the universities that we focus on. So the SUCs in CAR include uh, the ABRA State Institute of Sciences and Technology or ASSIST in ABRA, Apayao State College, uh, Benguet State University, Ifugao State University, Kalinga State University, the Mountain Province, State Polytechnic College, and of course, University of the Philippines Baguio here in Baguio City. With regards to methodology, we started actually conceptualizing and designing the research late 2019 to early 2020. So in January of last year, we were already drafting letters and sending them out to the SUCs to ask for their participation in the study. Um, and we also sent a proposal, but then, um, you know, COVID happened in March 2020, and the team had to reevaluate and rethink the strategies that um, we had to employ in order to still um, come up with uh, some data or some analysis, uh, some insights regarding Indigenous peoples' education in the region. So here uh, in this table, you can see what our proposed or what our initial uh, methodologies were and how that translated you know, during the lockdowns when uh, travel restrictions were imposed on the whole well, country, basically. So instead of face-to-face -face key informant interviews, we had an online questionnaire. Unfortunately, it was very, uh, very few faculty members responded to that, to that questionnaire. Well, understandably so because of the priorities of that time. Um, and then for focus group discussions, uh, we were able to hold one FGD at Benguet State University. And unfortunately, we weren't able to go through with our field work and we weren't able to um, hold these activities in the other campuses. We also wanted to do a policy and curriculum review using you know, primary data uh, from the universities themselves because we requested them but then we couldn't travel and communication was really tough. So we had to reorient our data gathering and we looked at secondary data instead from published documents from the schools themselves, you know, official documents. Because of that, uh, most, I think the most data that we were able to get were from, you know, nearby universities such as UP Baguio and Beckett State University. Um, and so we decided that the study would be more of a more of a secondary research with um, case studies in places where we had bountiful primary data. As for our findings, uh, I'd like to note that these are you know initial results. We are still writing the output itself, but we hope that um, through this conference, we will also be able to validate some of these initial results. So we do look forward to the open forum later on. So as for the mechanisms, processes, and tools, it could be divided roughly into two major um, categories. So in curriculum and then in research. So in curriculum, we tried to look at um, existing efforts prior to ch the CHED memo, some expressed issues on integration, if there are issues, and we also wanted to know why faculty or why institutions thought it would be important to integrate Indigenous people's education into make the mainstream curricula. And then we also wanted to look at um, changes after the CHED memo order number two. So aside from curriculum, we also found that research was another primary mechanism or process or tool which Sir Jeff will be discussing in more detail a bit later. Um, but as for now, you can already see the common threads or themes that we found um, in this category across the SUCs that we looked at. The existing efforts prior to CHED memo number two has uh, have included the institutionalization of degree programs and IP-related courses, so such that, for example, in MPSPC, they have an MA in Rural Development, major in Indigenous Education, which was institutionalized in 2011. And then there are also some programs in Ifugao State and Kalinga State. Apayao State College has um, IKSP courses offered through the IP Education Program under the BS Education and 
bachelor and elementary education programs. BSU has um, courses on indigenous knowledge and agriculture. Um, it's a major course taken by all students of the Department of Extension Education. Aside from the institutionalization of these degree programs and courses, uh, IP themes or topics have also been integrated in various disciplinal courses, such as in UP Baguio, Indigenous Knowledge or Indigenous study, Studies has often been integrated in different courses across the three colleges in arts and communication, natural sciences, and social sciences. Still, there were some expressed issues on integration. The first issue would be that teachers lack confidence in teaching lessons infused with IP themes. So oftentimes we see that um, IP related subjects, courses, or activities um, become not necessarily relegated, but become assigned to the same people over and over again. The reason for this is that teachers say they don't ha they're not very confident in teaching these lessons because for the longest time it hasn't been a priority when they were studying for instance or when they started teaching Th that said integration is generally viewed as teachers initiatives and a possible explanation for this apprehension about iPad we think would be that indigenization poses a challenge to most teachers. It takes you out of your comfort zone and what you've already been taught to teach um, during your own experience in college or in graduate school. So it entails a lot of retooling on the part of the faculty member and a part of the teacher to be able to have confidence to teach it and to teach it well. Integration is informed by local realities, which is true not just for SUC such as Kalinga State and Ifugao State, which have a very strong link or strong grounding to their communities. Much of what they offer, uh, they offer with the perspective of these are courses that would help the community around us would help students get a deeper understanding of their culture. So in Kalinga State, for example, a course in public administration and indigenous governance covers an in-depth discussion of the Podong. And the expectation is that the students who get a degree in public administration will eventually work in the province with knowledge about both indigenous and contemporary uh, methods of governance. There are several other um, examples, but I think we can go into a deeper discussion of the question and answer portion instead of uh, now. The way we see it, it's basically an affirmation of the correctness of what these state universities and colleges have been doing for many years. Um, if at all, we think that the memo gave these SUCs more confidence in pushing through with their integration efforts and um, it formalized what they've already been doing for a long time. Thank you, Ma'am Pao. Before I continue with our presentation, I would like to apologize ahead if you will not be able to see me in the inset, as I recorded my part in our house with the better audio settings, and I leave it to your imagination where this is. To continue, under the research component or mechanisms, processes, and tools, the team observed that there are significant researches being done on IK. These researches focus mostly on material culture, biodiversity, governance, natural resource management, and agricultural production practices, including intangible culture, among others. The SUCs have existing IP-related or dedicated research centers, which are either established with own resources or through linkages with international and national agencies. For example, UP Baguio's the Cordillera Studies Center, established in 1980, the Ifugao State University with their International Innovation Center for Partnership with International Agencies, while the Apayao State College has their Cultural and Historical Studies Center. For the other SUCs, research on IK and IP studies are lodged with the Research and Development Departments. BSU has lodged the researches on IK and IPED with their Institute for Social Research and Development. Despite the numbers of researches done on IK and the significant centers established to do research, the challenge is how research gets translated or used to inform curriculum. These research outputs are potential sources or materials for IPED. IPSU has started using 
the research output as reference materials in the preparation of IK workbooks, which are utilized in their Ifugao IK Educators training program. This program is attended by teachers from the secondary level and the higher education and is in coordination with the Department of Education. It was also observed that some SUCs have their own academic journals where faculty researchers are able to publish, as you will see in the next slide. We have the Cordillera Review or the TCR by UP Baguio, MPSPC journals for Mountain Province State Polytechnic College, the Upland Farm Journal for IPSU, Mountain Journal for Science and Interdisciplinary Research for the BSU. So the map indicates where these SUCs are located in Cordillera. So moving on, on the training needs to operationalize IP education, there is an urgent need to improve the capacity of staff to teach lessons where IP teams or topics are integrated. As it was mentioned earlier, either teachers are not confident to teach IP lessons or have little background on culture. Realizing these limitations, some SUCs like IPSU hold trainings for educators on how to teach IP team lessons and how to write teaching materials and workbooks on IK. On institutional strengths and linkages, the existence of institutional policy helps sustain IP education efforts with an SUC. With a policy, IP education is more systematically addressed, more faculty are involved, resources are made available, and curricular special programs are put in place. A good example is UPB which has identified Cordillera studies as its niche, the Ifugao State University, which maximizes partnership both at the local and national international levels to institutionalize their IK and I IPED initiatives. In the absence of well-articulated policy, IPED efforts seem to depend on the advocacy and trust of administration, which could change once new leaders get elected. And there is heavy reliance on champions, faculty, and staff who are known to be into IP education, IP team researchers. Uh, there is no sustained program for IPED and it is totally dependent on what the administrators want during their term. So without a policy, resources are not secured, training of faculty are not given priority and in initiatives are not sustained. Linkages is another good avenue implored by the SUCs to support their initiatives on promoting IPED. SUCs like the Apayao State College, IPSU, Benguet State University, Kalinga State University, and UP Baguio have international linkages that support IP education. However, we were not able to find some data about ABRA State Institute of Science and Technology. We may have some participants who will be able to shed light on the linkages of ASSIST. Linkaging and networking is a strength that can be further maximized to sustain promotion of IPED in the future. It is noteworthy to mention the SUCs have different levels of capacity to implement the CHED memo. Some have the required capacity and resources, and others may find difficulty to allocate existing resources to the endeavor. While this may be the case, they have been doing it for years in various forms. The issuance of the memo from CHED did not change what the SUCs have been doing, but rather affirmed and strengthened their actions, except for UPB and IPSU, where a policy exists or articulated as an academic niche. Efforts in general have been sporadic and not harmonized. In general, there is not much indication thus far that the CHED memo injected a new commitment and vigor to IPED efforts in the SUCs. So what are our recommendations? To address the concern that systematic institutional response to the CHED memo is lacking, there needs to be a coordinated, systematic, holistic response to assess capacity and resources of the SUCs, there is also a need to identify and strengthen what policies are existing that support IPED, what policies need to be in place to sustain it, what trainings and retooling are needed. Uh, there's a need to review and revise existing curricula or co courses wherein IPED will be integrated. And this should happen at the regional level, led by CHED, and at the institutional level of the SUCs. CHED could also learn from how the Department of Education prepared for its IPED program before it was rolled out and as well as how it is being implemented now. In terms of curriculum, 
review of existing curricular programs related to IK and IP education uh, to assess and upgrade in order to better respond to the memo and challenges of IB education. Strengthen capacity and confidence of teachers. There's also a need to level off on what IPED at the higher education intends, on why integration is essential, and including the leveling off of the policies like the CHED memo, its relations to the DepEd's IPED program, the IPRA, and other policies. Uh, there is a need to upgrade breadth and depth of research, meaning there has to be a deeper analysis of research results, how to use research to understand current realities of societies, and how to transform indigenous people's lives, theorize about change, problematize the indigenous, or generally what it means to be indigenous now. There is also a need to translate research outputs into materials for iPad to address expressed concern for lack of materials. We should also strengthen existing research centers to respond to IP education and IP integration, meaning the research centers are an avenue wherein we can formulate modules and develop materials for uh, teaching. Aside from that, we should continue research dissemination through peer-reviewed journals and conferences and make these researches re readily available and accessible to the public. In terms of training, researchers and educators should be capacitated on how to develop instructional materials out of the research outputs. Further sustain and ten intensify teachers' training on iPad in order to strengthen their capacity, boost their confidence, increase appreciation and understanding of teachers' role in the promotion of iPad. On institutional strength and linkages and collaboration, it is important to set up enabling environment and mechanisms such as policy, incentives, trainings, resources, among others, that will facilitate institutionalization and sustainability of IPED at the higher education level. Inter-SUC collaboration, like holding conferences, workshops, to discuss and share experiences on how IPED is being done in each SUC and how the memo is being implemented, will greatly help in further developing a uniform understanding on how to integrate IPED across SUC processes. SUCs and CHED should also maximize existing networks like the NICHE or the National Indigenous Coalition in Higher Education. So NICHE conducts seminars, uh, forums, and focus group discussions regarding IPED and how to further improve research on uh, indigenous knowledge. So this will end my part of the presentation. For your questions and clarifications, you may direct them to the following. Thank you very much for listening and keep safe. The second presentation is uh, by Sir Stanley Anongos on the accommodation of indigenous dances in higher education institutions in CAR. So Sir Stanley F. Anongos is a faculty member of the Social Sciences of Benguet State University. He earned a Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences at UP Baguio, an MA in Social Studies at BSU, and a PhD in history at UP Diliman. His interest in dances stems from his involvement with VSU Center for Culture and the Arts as director. With the CCA, he led VSU's cultural group in regional and national indigenous dance performances, as well as in local cultural festivals. At VSU, he served as chairman of the Department of Social Sciences as head of BSU's museum and director of the school's Center for Culture and the Arts. His research involve, involves uh, Cordillera history, culture, and society. So let's please watch his presentation and a friendly reminder to everyone to please keep their uh, microphones on mute as the presentation is ongoing. Thank you. Pleasant day to all. Greetings from Benguet State University. This uh, paper looks at the indigenization experiences of government uh, tertiary schools in the region of Cordillera, Philippines, particularly in their treatment and accommodation of Cordillera traditional dances and student performances. Cordillera region in the Philippines is populated mainly by indigenous peoples, except for a multi-ethnic city of Baguio and an Ilocano-dominated lowland Abra. Six of the seven state tertiary schools in this region 
distributed in each of the six provinces cater to mostly IP students. I argue in this study that government tertiary schools in the Cordillera are slowly taking the role as a sanctuary for Cordillera cultural dances. Uh, this paper further contends that the school's accommodation of dance performances also places these traditional dances to inevitable dance alterations. Despite the long history of school-based performances, dances and dance groups were never formally integrated in the academic institutions. An important uh, boost to cultural dances in tertiary schools occurred in 2003 with the organizing of cultural competitions by the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges, or PASOK. Here, the an indigenous dance uh, became uh, one of the many areas of competition. So the need for representation and participation in the cultural event compelled tertiary schools to activate or reorganize cultural dance groups. The national competition, uh, dubbed as uh, PASOK National Culture and the Arts Festival, uh, had regional screening competitions. So six. Uh, state universities and colleges in CAR compete among themselves in the Karasuk Culture and the Arts Festival as a preliminary screen screening for regional winners. And the winners represented uh, the region in the national level. The school's representation to the PASOK competition um, resulted to the creation of uh, an office in the six uh, state universities in CAR. So this is the beginning of social cultural offices whose uh, primary composition, composition is the various performing groups lodged under the office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs. The social cultural office is coordinative in nature as its primary function is to facilitate the school's participation in the cultural competition. Composing this office are various performing arts groups, mainly uh, dance groups. While these are under the VPAA or academic affairs, the line of supervision from that office to the performers is still limited to administrative staffs. Instead, the operation of the office is more or less uh, the operation uh, of uh, the sociocultural offices are more or less in the hands of the director and coaches and the choreographies of performances are left to creative agencies of the performers. Part of the formal accommodation of cultural dances and dance groups, most uh, tertiary schools provided the scholarship to its performers. School dance uh, also allowed opportunities for travels to dance performers. Uh, for example, all dance groups have at one time or another moved out of their provinces and the region for performances. Um, some even journeyed outside of the country. Uh, special events, no? uh, especially when there are school uh, visitors. In fact, it is safe to say um, that it is uh, that dancing is uh, the core or the key uh, uh, nature of, of the of the visitors entertainment. The usual school events when the dance groups were summoned to perform include community parades, uh, a celebration of Foundation Day, Indigenous Month in October, Linggo ng Wika and at times intra-school dance competitions. Some same roles early school dances and dancers served. Established dance groups also get invited by external organizations or in private events. In some instances, these groups are invited to perform in town fiestas, provincial uh, foundations, and other important local government um, events. Such kind of performances remain extracurricular, however, even if the sociocultural offices are linked to the Office of the Academic Affairs. 
In fact, except for the dance competition engendered by PASOK, school dances today mimic the earlier traditions of performances, being tourist or visitor oriented. There is also a vague link between cultural dance performances to other cultural programs of the schools. The formation of ethnic dance groups in Karsuks occurred independently of any cultural program. In most cases, the dance group's formal creation preceded any school-based cultural programs. At Benguet State University, for example, the Contad dance troupe was organized in 1969, but the first concrete cultural program of the school was crafted in 1986. The Ifugao State University dance group was, all, was also already active years before the establishment of a school of living tradition in 2004. Um, both uh, cultural programs failed to integrate cultural dances. There are also admirable school uh, academic programs related to Cordillera culture, but are not directly linked to cultural dance program. Uh, Mountain Province State Polytechnic College, for example, has integrated indigenous cuisine in the hotel and restaurant management curriculum, an indigenous justice system under criminology curriculum, and indigenous people's education for teacher education curriculum. In the graduate level, uh, they also offer a history and development of, court, of Cordillera. Uh, Benguet State University and IFSU also offer indigenous knowledge systems and practices. In the master's level for the former, and in the undergraduate, undergraduate level, level for the latter. Apayao State College uh, has an ethnographic museum at Connor, in Connor, and in 2014, an Apayao Center for Historical and Cultural Studies. None of these, uh, however, uh, were explicitly tied to cultural dance programs, so that uh, cultural dancing in these schools remain autonomous and uh, segregated. Being extracurricular, uh, cultural dance experiences in schools still remain uh, voluntary, attracting only a few passionate performers to form these dance groups and to engage in cultural uh, uh, dancing. Nevertheless, the establishment of social cultural offices in schools and its attachment uh, of cultural dances and dance group is therefore a watershed in the school recognition of cultural dances. Social cultural offices, formalized integration, provided an office and supported the group with funds and in effect earned uh, uh, academic uh, recognition. We define or I define curricularity here to connote the integration of traditional dances into appropriate fields within the academy. This is in recognition of, of the uh, signs uh, that uh, there are possibilities of these dances getting integrated formally into the academic uh, offerings. Curricularity approaches the same idea of indigenizing curriculum or locating it in the intellectual and uh, uh, epistemological platform of schools. Ifugao State University provides a promising diversion out of extracurricular character of school curricular dance. In 2014, an indigenous related course was offered as a mandatory elective. The course is, in, the course is entitled Ifugao Indigenous Knowledge Systems. And the reference material for the course was earlier crafted. Uh, this is what you see on the screen. The reference book entitled Ifugao Indigenous Knowledge Workbook covers indigenous approaches in various fields, including dances. The emphasis depends on the discretion of the course facilitator, but conveniently rests on the facilitator's field so that a political science teacher may place more importance to the Ifugao justice system, while an arts teacher like Lydia de Castro, who used to be the director of the social cultural affairs of that university, puts premium on dance. In effect, in effect, the course provided a chance for cultural dance enthusiasts like uh, de Castro to push an agenda for a focused teaching of Ifugao dances. The IKSP class also became a venue for her as a director of social cultural office to recruit performers for the cultural dance group. 
the IFUGO Indigenous Knowledge course in effect opened an opportunity for the integration of such dances in academic subjects and a wider participation in cultural uh, dancing. A promising field for further integration of indigenous dances is in physical uh, education. Uh, what you see uh, on the screen are BSU students uh, performing uh, uh, Cordillera cultural uh, dances. If so, Kalinga State University and Benga State University have intermittently experimented the inclusion of ethnic dances in their rhythmic dance classes, claiming that this is the appropriate course where CHED uh, or the Commission of, for Higher Education allows institutional courses. Physical education teachers of uh, Ifugao State University in particular made uh, greater strides uh, in their integration uh, by their notations of Ifugao dances. Uh, so it is their notations uh, that became the basis for teaching Ifugao dances uh, to their students. Other teachers in the different schools under study also incorporated IKS and dancing in their own fields, but only on a very individual initiative. Cultural dancing, for example, is an essential component for some faculty members handling um, classes in Philippine history at BSU. Students are assigned particular Highland dances or dance to learn and perform for a final evaluation. All these uh, attempts of integration allowed the experience of cultural dance in the classroom for students within the bounds of curricular. Nevertheless, aligning cultural dances to the curricular remains a struggle to most of the schools. Aside from being isolated and tentative, these are not anchored on well-planned institutional cultural programs that would have defined all these assertive expressions of dance incorporations into the curricular. In 2019, um, uh, Ched came up with a memorandum, uh, uh, which you see on the screen, um, instruct, instructing uh, uh, tertiary schools to integrate indigenous studies in their, in their education. How this uh, is being implemented uh, by schools, uh, of course, uh, is vague. The nature of uh, school dancing also opened um, cultural dances to uh, modifications. It should be understood that cultural dances in the Cordillera are performed mostly in the context of community ceremonies, such as Thanksgiving and, and, uh, and wedding. But when these dances were transported to the schools and out of community ceremony context, the value and meaning of the dances change entirely. The alteration of cultural dances is, of course, a result of uh, historical changes that the region underwent, such as Christianization, tourism, education, as well as what Peterson noted as diminished spiritual powers of those who were the keepers of traditional spiritual practices. But school dances also, but school dances uh, also became a venue for dance alteration. In all of this, what is left in off-context performances are merely the movements and the steps. Dance movements and the steps are standardized in most dance school context, as it were in tourist shows. Performers move in unison and identical steps guided by an understanding that the elegance of the dance heavily depended on such homogeneity. This is how school intermissions conditioned ethnic dance and dances, taming individualized motley community dances into restrained movements. In community performances of these dances in the Cordillera, including the communities among the Bontoks and Apply that we are part of, individual deviations are actually the norm as dancing is a spontaneous expression by performers allowing what Georgius calls a continuous differentiation and constant transformation. The alteration for the alteration from heterogeneous styles into a uniform march 
is often ignored even by dance coaches and performers interviewed. This attitude reflects a sense of tolerance to minor changes, which are perceived to do no serious modification of the dances. They in fact declare that they go through continuous consultation with other dance keepers, learn from actual uh, community dance performers, performances, and rehearse this to no end. In these interactions, community members actually sanction homogeneous dance movements of student performers, even as they also assert proper positions and move proper positions and movement of hands, elevation of legs and pace of execution. Uh, the toleration is not surprising uh, as this is, this is a consistent manifestation of how community dances allow for variations in dances. Other ethnic uh, dance coaches, however, acknowledge this transformation, sharing that, the, sharing that stage performances are indeed rehearsed along uniformity. Uniformity in dance is for stage shows, admits one dance teacher, but loosens when the same students perform off stage. Dance modification along dance competitions that school performers participate are more drastic and discernible. This is so because uh, it usually requires a written standard or a noted literature, usually authored by non-native for the evaluation of the dances. In the experience of uh, uh, car uh, tertiary schools, such literature with its radically altered form offended uh, some coaches and performers. In 2015, a uh, cultural competition, for example, the IFSU dance group walked out during the announcement of winners after it learned that it was disqualified due to some insertions in the dance piece that were not present in the judges' literature, but were originally part of the Ifugao dance. While the judges were correct as they relied on the PASOK choice of a published dance literature, the IFSU uh, dancers stuck to their perceived correctness of the dance. The 2000 uh, uh, Karasok uh, competition in Kalinga became a deja vu experience for IFSU. They lost the cultural dance contest, again, because they did not adhere to the dance literature of the Ifuga Uyaoi dance to the letter. Their coach insisted very strongly that the literature did not capture the true Ifugao Uyaoi. In frustration, she justified that between disrespecting their own dance and winning the contest, they would rather stand for the former. Other coaches and advisors share IFSU's sentiments, but none so strongly expressed it as the IFSU performers, mainly because it so happened that the dance piece chosen in this contest were Ifugao dances. Paso cultural competition and its regional screening level therefore became a venue for Cordillera dance alterations as it is characterized by impositions of ethnic dance literature lifted from eminent Philippine dance authors. For 2018, our Cord Cordillera dances Four Cordillera dances were selected from Ramon Ubusan's work, from which uh, schools chose one to perform for the competition. Uh, Benguet State University represented the uh, CAR and brought its own interpretation of Ubusan's Ifugao Uyaoi to the national competition in Davao. And it got disqualified because it mixed females and males in the dance. The judges pointed out that Ubusan's Uyaoi only included male performers. The PASOK sponsored cultural dance competition is a continuing practice of popularizing dances as interpreted by dance ethnologists whose background are everything but uh, indigenous. These dance interpretations already altered the performances of these traditional dances but being imposed on the Cordillera dance school dance groups themselves adds to the distortion of already modeled indigenous dances. 
inter-ethnic, uh, inter-school cultural dance competitions are, are somehow tricky in their repercussions. So that while it brings the academic closer to the traditional dances, it also brings unwanted uh, changes. In conclusion, uh, despite the seeming fragmented uh, cultural programs in the schools, state universities and colleges in the region are opening a platform where indigenous cultural dances could be performed and sustained with scholarship, with allowances, a formal office to manage it, and the opportunities for students to showcase the dance in and outside the school, cultural, dance, cultural dances might have found a new home in schools. Nevertheless, dance alterations are inevitable in the migration of dances from communities to the school. The detachment of the dance from the ceremonial context certainly opened the dances to further modifications. The nature of uh, school sanctioned performances in the form of program intermissions, visitor entertainment and competitions rework the dance steps, music, duration, and heterogeneity. Also, the cultural competitions conceived by PASOP, while instrumental in formally integrating cultural dance groups in the structure of their in the structure of state higher education, also contributed to dance alteration by insisting on the use of ethnic dance choreographies from flawed interpretations. PASO condones the course of Cordillera dance revision. Uh, we are now ready for the third paper presentation. The paper is titled Bleak Visions, a reflection on the educational attainment of Sitio Bacao's Aita community with authors, Mr. Philip Vendicacion, Renzo Mires, um, uh, Mr. Mikwa, Angeline Mikwa, Eliza, uh, Tuazon and Apollo Edrano. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Vendicacion is an instructor at the Finma Araulio University in Cabanatuan City, teaching social science subjects and at the same time a graduate student at the University of the Cordilleras, taking up masters in cultural education as a program. His as a program, his team includes. Oh, as I said, Mr. Renz, Michael Ramirez, Ms. Angeline Miqua, Ms. Eliza Tuazon, and Mr. Apollo Andrano. So let us listen to the presentation. Good day. I am Sir Philip Mercado Vendicacion, a social science college instructor in Nueva Ecija, and a graduate school student in the University of the Cordilleras at the same time. On behalf of my co-researchers, I will be the one who will be presenting our research. And our research is an entitled as Blick Visions, a Reflection on the Educational Attainment of Sichabacao's Aita Community. Aitas who were displaced during the Mount Pinatubo eruption in 1991 have not been provided with sufficient basic services, and they have not been able to fully communicate their needs to the government especially with regard to their education. As a response, the government integrated the Indigenous People Education Program under the Department of Education to address the issue of providing them with their basic right to education. However, not all schools practice the iPad program, and not all IATAS embrace this program due to varying reasons, <laughs> economic and sociocultural factors. Thus, this paper focused on the level of educational attainment of the community of Bacao, Barangay Doña Osepa, Palayan City, Nueva Ecija, and the differing grounds influencing the non-fulfillment of the ITES education. It draws on the responses, or this study draws on the responses of 10 ITES with ages 15 to 25 years of age, and also the qualitative approach through a purposive sampling was used in this study and instruments used in the data gathering were observation guide, interview guide, and focused group discussion. Moreover, financial problem, difference in priorities, early pregnancy, and discrimination are among the prevalent factors in the respondents' reasons for discontinuing their education. Furthermore, the other respondents still continuing 
are still continuing their education despite the same factors. Meaning, they still want to finish high school because of the government statement that once they finish senior high school, they are automatically qualified to have a job. So that's it. Now, let's dig in with the brief background of the study of our research. To begin with, for the indigenous peoples, these are a group of people or homogeneous societies identified by self-ascription and ascription by others who have continuously lived as organized community and communally bounded and defined territory and who have under claims of ownership since time immemorial, occupied, possessed, customs, tradition, and other distinctive cultural traits or who have, through resistance to political, social, and cultural inroads of colonization, non-indigenous religions and culture become historically differentiated from the majority of Filipinos according to the Philippine Statistics Authority. Also, they are among the poorest and most disadvantaged social group in the country. Illiteracy, unemployment, and most disadvantaged social group in the country saying that um, aside from the illiteracy, unemployment, and incidence of poverty are much higher among them than the rest of the population. Moreover, IT settlements are remote without access to basic services and are characterized by a high incidence of morbidity, mortality, and malnutrition. Also, it is said here that there are 110 major indigenous groups in the Philippines. Most of the indigenous peoples depend on a traditional Sweden agriculture utilizing available upland areas. And to add on that, undeniably the Philippines is indeed a culture-rich country which has its own various indigenous peoples who are spread out all over its 7,107 islands. Uh, these indigenous peoples are composed of the different ethno-linguistic groups and are estimated to be 10 to 20 percent of the country's population as of 2015, according to the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs. A vast majority also of the 12 million population of the indigenous peoples in the Philippines reside in the uplands, which they claim as part of their traditional territories. And actually, most of the remaining natural resources in the country are found within the traditional lands of the indigenous peoples. One of these indigenous peoples is uh, the Aitas. And just like the other Aitas, most of the Aitas reside on the mountainous and were remote areas which were not easily reached by the regular types of transportations. The Aitas are found in the different parts of the Philippines, but a large number are found in Luzon Island. And they specifically mostly reside in the remote parts of Zambales, Pampanga, Tarlac, Bataan, and of course, Nueva Ecija. As they have migrated here to these areas when the Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991. Also, the Encyclopedia of Philippine Arts has given them the names Aita, Agta, Atta, Ati, and Ita. Uh, they are small in stature, and they were previously called Negritos, who were the one of the first settlers in the Philippines according to history. Uh, thus, the Aitas are small and short in stature and have dark skin and have curl hair. To add on that, it is said here that there are approximately 90,000 Aitas in the Philippines. Uh, their way of life has been preserved even though the modernization that the Philippines has undergone and this limited, and even though this limited their access to the essentials that is mainstream for Filipinos, they have been starting from simple acquisition of medical healthcare for our simple diseases to receive education, which would prepare them for a more developed way of living. But due to the lack of education, the IPs, including the ITAS, have been marginalized economically, politically, and socially in the past decades. Due to this, more and more government and non-government organizations, such as the United Nations, 
the Episcopal Commission on the Indigenous Peoples and the National Commission on the Indigenous Peoples work for the protection of the IPs to prevent them from alienation to mainstream society. At present, some of the IT communities can be reached through transportation such as motorcycles and jeepneys, which has improved their access to formal education. Furthermore, the Department of Education ordered number 22, series of 2016 specifically instituted the Indigenous Peoples Education Program, which is its response to the right of Indigenous peoples to basic education that is responsive to their context respects their identities and promotes the value of their indigenous knowledge, skills, and other aspects of their cultural heritage. This has paved way to more ITAS um, re receiving formal education through the health of government and the educational sectors as well. However, the implications and the aims of the IPED program cannot be fully realized at present as it has only been three years since its launching. But it's still a fact that many of the ITAs in different parts of the country still are undereducated. Because of this, private organizations and groups have started with platforms to help in the education of the ITAs. To add on that, the Clark Development Corporation, CDC, for instance, has recently launched a program called AITA Pangsarili, Pagsasarili, program, which gives an avenue for 50 idle children aged 3 to 4 years old to be taught useful information on cognitive learning and human and social development in their formative years, according to Del Rosario 2019. <clears throat> also, the ITAs are one of the IPs in the Philippines who are experiencing the same undesirable plight regarding the advancement of their education. Because of the social divide in the main societies and the IP communities, including that of the ITAs, they are also subjected to discrimination, which is one of the factors for them not to continue their education. And to fill the gap in education among the undereducated ITAs, the Grassroots Leadership Course, GLC, and the Alternative Learning System, ALS, have been made available as programs to the IT communities from 1999 to 2007 in some communities, according to Leeson, Leeson Valner, and Pot Gormick, 2012. Furthermore, various non-government sectors have also stepped into, highlight, into highlighting the education of the ITAs. Microsoft, in partnership with Lyceum of the Philippines, Manila, it started a project which aims to equip the ITAS in Magiskis with future red skills such as immersion in ICT, according to Microsoft 2018. <coughs> also, excuse me. Also, the adult literacy program was also started in Pampanga to address the educational gap of the adult ITAS in the place, and it has really greatly influence their way of life and thinking regarding working to be able to send their children to school. However, there still are instances when they would not make it to the project because they would have to work in their fields in order for them to have a money, according to Sunstar 2015. And then aside from the aforementioned programs, the Indigenous Peoples Education IPAD program was also launched in 2016, but not all IPs IATAS included, have fully embraced such a program. In a recent study of the IATAS in Mid by Tan, the results revealed that the respondents are 21 to 76 years old, mostly female, and married. Most households have four to five members, and most have gone through elementary grades, and others made it to high school, but only 6.38% have gone to vocational or college level, according to Spirit of 2017. Uh, thus, this only shows that despite the growing efforts for the education of the indigenous ITAS, there is still a gap in their educational attainment. And that is why, allow me now to present here what are the promising future that's waiting for them for this slide. 
actually these are the reasons why some of them were not able to pursue their studies. First of it is financial problems. Out of 10 interviewers, you know what, five of them answered that financial problems or poverty became a hindrance in pursuing their study. They have explained that since they only depend on their location, their only source of income is through agriculture. And actually, the sad reality here uh, there was it would also take them at least more over an hour in order for them to get to the city. And that is really the first challenge, financial problem, because they cannot work in their society during that time or even up until now. And then for the next slide, okay, most of them or half of them also mentioned that some Aitas fell in love early. That is why they stopped their studies to take care of their children. Uh, first, with the first reason that poverty is the main problem, the second one is that um, falling in love too early was also a problem for them because um, they believe that since they are only settling with their people surrounding them, that they don't have any background of what is life outside their society, their community. Uh, they engage first into relationships like that, even though they are still young. And that is why, since they also get got pregnant early, uh, they believe that they no longer need to study. They just focus on their families, okay? Next is for the family obligations. Uh, being the eldest in the family, according to them, requires a big responsibility because uh, their role is to become the second parent to their siblings when their parents are not around. Same is also true when raising a family. Since ITES are struggling financially, the eldest needs to step in and also work for their living. So it's a family matter as well. Also, the next thing here is, do they still want to continue? Do they still want to finish their studies? Um, the great thing here is, the good thing here is that surprised us researchers the most is that despite all the hardships and problems they have encountered, I still want to pursue their studies. Most of them even said that if they would be given chance or opportunity to be helped by the government in order for them to afford schooling or attending schools, they would go back and study again. And when they were asked whether they want to become, if they will study, uh, most of them said that they want to become teacher, they want to become medical frontliners, nurse, doctors, and for the guys, for the males, uh, they revealed that they want to become police, policemen or um, men in uniform for serving for our country's protection, army, something like that. And finally, um, young Aitas are still determined, okay? They are still determined um, despite, um, I think, are they still determined? Yes. The answer here is that young ITAS are still determined to pursue their studies despite the challenges that they face. During the interview, we noticed that most of them possesses most of them possess self-determination. According also to Edward Desi and Richard Ryan's book entitled Self-Determination and Intrinsic Motivation in Human Behavior, people need to feel in control of their own behaviors and goals. And with this sense of being able to take care of their own direction or with their own path, this will result in a real change wherein it will play a major part in helping people feel that they are really self-determined and that they have self-determination that will eventually help them to set their goals. But actually, the, the main concern here is that even though they are determined, they are still seeking and asking for scholarships, benefits, and opportunities. That's why until now, they have these voices that they want to echo to everyone that even though they belong to the indigenous peoples, even though they are Aitas, there is nothing wrong with that because they believe that 
they are still part of this country. Okay, it's just so happened that they are different from usual Filipinos. And with that thinking of most people that they don't have any dreams of finishing their degrees or studies, that is wrong because according to them, they are really determined. They really want to finish their studies. All they want is just to have support from our government. Okay, and to provide some uh, photo documentations when we had this interview last year, even before the pandemic came to the Philippines. Here is the next slide. Yes, uh, that's me. The, and here are my co researchers, and these are uh, the children that we interviewed during that time. Uh, actually, not all of them. Okay, for these children, they were not interviewed. Only the squirrel, the squirrel, the squirrel, the squirrel, the squirrel, and so on. And for our references, you may find it on the next slide. So that is all. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, so thank you very much for those uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat box already. Okay, so just very briefly, uh, the three papers had to do with uh, the various efforts to uh, integrate IP education in the various uh, school, school curricula. And uh, the first paper is still a work in progress. And as they said, uh, perhaps uh, given the number of participants in this room, we do have something like 98. Uh, 110 at a certain point. Uh, perhaps you can also uh, help them out by uh, giving your input into how your specific, your, your uh, own uh, institutions uh, are uh, doing efforts towards this. Our second paper has to do with the integration of, well, dance no? as a cultural form into the curriculum and uh, some of the challenges that uh, 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 that that that, that uh, this particular uh, thing faces. One thing which I found truly interesting about this um, presentation was uh, this matter of, and I, I think uh, the question in the chat box is going to uh, also uh, lead into this. Now, the matter of it being somehow uh, not fully integrated, primarily because it has to do primarily with extracurricular activities. And the third one, a very interesting thing, primarily because, well, we, we do know the challenges that indigenous communities face when it comes to uh, education in general. And, uh, well, uh, uh, just I don't mean to make it, uh, light of it, but how can you, after all, outlaw love? You know? So uh, <laughs> maybe we can go uh, uh, into the question that has been asked in the ch chat box. And this is from Ms. Shirley Gumpad. Uh, I think it, this would be uh, uh, more uh, target uh, for um, uh, Professor Anongos. However, uh, the other panelists may want to uh, chime in on this particular question. Uh, the question is, I understand the importance of letting the, learn the learners sorry, join extracurricular activities. However, it was observed that once they became involved in the extracurricular activities, they seem to neglect and have lost their interest and lose their interest in the academic subjects. What is, well, what are your, what are your stand, what is your stand on this? And what can you suggest you know, to keep or sustain learner interest in both this uh, ex extracurricular activities and their uh, academics? It's a very practical question, but I think uh, it is a concern of educators in general. So, uh, Professor Alangi, you are here. And I do know that Professor Alangi has actually done a lot of work with uh, teaching indigenous communities. Okay, so. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, Grace. Uh, Hello. Thank you. I, I thought that was meant for uh, Professor yeah. Anumos for Stan. Pero, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just. Maybe just to uh, give my uh, insights on the question, uh, espe especially in relation to the experiences of UP, of, uh, UP Baguio, 
I, I think um, um, in the case of UP Baguio, uh, the the um, uh, we we have the program for indigenous cultures, which also um, um, tries to to uh, whose whose primary primary um, uh, objective is to um, lead uh, lead uh, advocacy of uh, indigenous uh, issues in the university, and also it serves as a venue to gather our indigenous uh, students. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, from time to time, they they're also tasked to um, uh, hold uh, uh, performances, cultural performances. But I think the idea really is that this is a, a venue where. Uh, they strengthen their um, sense of belonging to the university, so that uh, you know, the initial shock you know, of coming from from the provinces and going to the university is somehow uh, mitigated through the through these uh, cultural uh, organizations within the university. And the idea is uh, for them to uh, to perform well or to succeed in their in their academics, even mm -hmm. if they are involved in this. Um, Extracurricular activities, so it shouldn't be a, an either or. Yeah. Uh, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, this this um, uh, performances, uh, this, this um, groups within the university are supposed to help our indigenous students um, uh, perform and to to have a sense of belonging within the university and to mitigate the initial cultural shock that may that may uh, that, that may that they may encounter when they enter the university. So in the long run, sana uh, instead of uh, one, uh, yung instead of the academics being sacrificed because of the involvement in this activity, sana must they they complementary. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the idea. I, I I know it's difficult, but that's the the balance that we need to strike, no? For so that our uh, indigenous students are also able to perform well in the academics while uh, uh, being involved in these cultural uh, performances. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alangi. And I think uh, that is the whole point. It's not, uh, it's not an either or thing. Uh, it's primarily, instead of looking at them as extracurricular, something which is peripheralized, uh, am I correct in saying that it should be integral to the formation of the student within the university? Uh, um, Professor Tindaan, uh, Professor Anongas, are you also here? Uh, I don't think he is. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, he is not because I also had wanted to uh, probably think about, I talk about uh, that notion of uh, problems with authenticity when it comes to indigenous dance, that sort of thing. And perhaps uh, since the panelist who is here, who would probably be able to to uh, address this would be uh, Professor Tindaan. Are you here, Professor Tindaan? Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, she, she is, is there, <laughs> there she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, well, uh, what struck me about Professor uh, Nongas' uh, thing was that uh, how uh, in the course of making it correct, sometimes that matter of uh, the, the affective, no community nature of it somehow already uh, is infringed upon. So uh, it somehow becomes a very interesting uh, paradoxic idea. But how can preservation now become innovative too? Yeah, um, I think uh, to respond to the idea of uh, how uh, it can be innovative as well. Um, what one thing might be that uh, which I which I it don't take away couldn't sa plenary this morning no when Professor Kuyo Geng was saying it should be a mindset in relation to how you do things mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's not really about uh, just performing because you are required by the university, you know, just an add on to a program or something <laughs> like that, mm -hmm. just to entertain guests or to be presented to international guests, especially, but it's uh, to, to encourage the students to to actually also engage um, in in the idea of not only performance, but to 
to integrate this in their academic formation. So let's say if you are performing, um, you're also uh, looking into the, the formations or the elements of the performance. So for, for example, so maybe some students can be encouraged to do research in relation to the idea of uh, per performativity, you know, the, the, their in involvement in relation to the performance of their culture and think hard about uh, their roles, their responsibilities in terms of performing. Because, for instance, if you are uh, an IP member, you become a representative of your community. So again, this becomes an, uh, it calls for uh, what we call reflexivity, you know, you you now represent a certain community and so it becomes, uh, you are quoted as the representation of a certain group. So um, perhaps we can encourage our students to, to think of this, uh, think about these concepts uh, further uh, rather than yun nga, hindi lang siya perf performance para sa mga rituals ng universidad or ng, ng, local, ng local government, for example, kundi kasama yung academic uh, uh, na, hindi lang academic, kundi kahit personal din na discovery sa kanilang direction as, as IP student. <laughs> to answer your question. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, Professor Anomos is here in the, in the meeting, I think. Yes. Professor Anomos? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, sir. Yes, uh, I, I'm sorry I can't, uh, I do not have the camera, no? but uh, I've been trying to <laughs> join the conversation. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure I got, uh, I did not, I, I think I did not get where we are, mm -hmm. uh, but I see some questions on the chat box. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the first one maybe. had to do with uh, uh, from Ms. Gumpad, and maybe uh, this was really actually for you. Uh, I, uh, and she says she understands the importance of letting learners join extracurricular activities. However, it's observed that once they join extracurricular activities, then the academics seem to wane. So what is uh, your stand on this? And what can you suggest to keep or sustain the learner's interest in both the extracurricular and the academic? Yeah, yes, yes, that's actually a, a serious concern, no? Mm. Uh, balancing the curricular and the non-curricular. In fact, uh, our performers at BSU and, um, and, and other uh, performers around the region actually share the same concern that they actually sacrifice a lot for, for uh, the representations that they do for the school. Uh, but that's that's the, the the point, no? That's the point. Uh, it doesn't have to be extracurricular. Uh, so, if if we could make um, cultural dances uh, be integrated into the curricular, then uh, um, we help, we sustain uh, cultural dances. At the same time, we are performing as uh, students. No? They are performing as students. No, so we erase the the problem between mm -hmm. curricular and extracurricular. Yes. So uh, I'd like to continue that also by by answering another question yes. on the chat about uh, CHED monitoring the the um, uh, what do you call this memorandum no on um, on integration. Uh, the memorandum came out in two thousand nineteen, but as I've said. Uh, uh, I do not think that uh, higher education um, institutions are really serious about this one. Uh, uh, it says in the memorandum that this uh, school should be submitting accomplishment results relating to this. But uh, I, I, I haven't heard uh, even in our institution that they do include an item in the accomplishment report to CHED uh, on uh, on things uh, related to the integration of uh, of Cordillera culture to the curriculum, mm -hmm. so so th this is the the whole point of uh, the paper, Dean. No, uh, that uh, uh, we have to really go beyond the the extracurricular and make it part of uh, 
of the curricular uh, in all uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so thank you for that, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Stindaan and uh, Professor Alangi, uh, perhaps you'd like to chime in on this question as well, because it was also actually uh, 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 for you, for the first presenter, did the CHED systematically monitor um, in the course of your research? Yeah, so Ruth, your... you want to answer that? Ako na lang, muna. <laughs> Kaya na lang, sir. Kaya na lang, sir. Yeah, actually, uh, we, we, we are planning to uh, do that because in the CHED memo, sabi ni, ni uh, Professor Anongos, uh, the CHED regional offices are supposed to monitor the implementation of uh, the, the different SUCs uh, in relation to the memo. But um, the, the research first concentrated on getting information on how these SUCs are implementing them. And we plan to validate by look, uh, going to, to CHED and uh, see whether they're able to um, complying uh, with that with that requirement uh, for them to submit uh, reports to CHED and for CHED to uh, to monitor the implementation. But as uh, Professor Anongos already said, na parang in the express of the issue, they, they don't seem to be nga naman, uh, reporting. So it's it's probably uh, part of the of the uh, challenges by the implementation of the memo. Uh, mm -hmm. Kasi it's, it only started in 2019 and then we uh, we had the pandemic that's why uh, very limited din pa yung information that we are able to uh, gather in relation to the implementation. Uh, that, that's also the reason why we are recommending for a more systematic uh, uh, guideline or direction from CHED and uh, within the institutions itself. Kasi parang feeling nga namin, the, the implement, implementation is quite uh, sporadic pa and hindi masyadong harmonized and coordinated. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that uh, can be done still because it's a good it's a good uh, um, uh, objective no you know, you know, the, you know, the, the what the memo is trying to um, to uh, uh, accomplish is is quite important um, we just need to do it more systematically and help each okay. other out para mas ma accomplish natin yung yung objective sa memo thank you so thank you very, very much for that. Oh, it is already 2.31. Uh, there are still some uh, questions in the chat box, chat box, but perhaps you can uh, contact the presenters directly as the next panel is uh, going to be starting or perhaps is already starting at this very moment. So thank you very much for attending this panel. And we hope you have a fruitful day ahead and more fruitful days to come. So thank you.